I'm grateful to be here with all of you today. Sorry we got a little late in coming. The Kirtan was going on so nicely, I thought that my class is going to be an interruption in the Kirtan. <laughs> so, so I'll talk about Radharani in the Bhagavad Gita. I'll talk this. Let's see what we are going to talk about. So if you talk of Radharani, what does that mean? No? There is the person Radharani, then there is the principal Radharani, then there is the mood of Radharani, and then there is the remembrance of Radharani. So now you could say that at one level, if you talk about the glory of Radharani from the Bhagavad Gita, well, Radharani is not present in the Bhagavad Gita. So how can you talk about the glory, her glories over there? Yeah, in terms of the person, she is not present there. There is no active presence of Radharani in the Bhagavad Gita. There are only four characters in the Bhagavad Gita primarily. It's Krishna and Arjuna. And who are the other two characters? The Tarashtra and Sanjay. Mm -hmm. So, as a person, we could say Radharani is absent. But that is where we need to understand that Radharani is not just a person. She is definitely a person. But when you say she is just a person, that means we start equating her with any other ordinary person. So this is sometimes when we are understanding philosophical realities. There is often a conflict between personal and impersonal. So the absolute truth. What is the nature of the absolute truth? So we may say that the absolute truth is a person and some may say the absolute truth is a principle and it's not a person. Hmm? However, the reality is that the absolute truth is both a person and a principle. That the absolute truth is, in principle means Janma Dhyasyataha, the source of everything. So like Guru, Guru is a person and Guru is also Tattva. If we consider the Guru only to be a person, then that will lead to a personality cult being formed around it. Hmm? If we consider the Guru only to be a principle, then we won't have any personal relationship, any personal inspiration. We will treat the Guru just like a light switch. You know, okay, I don't get power from light switch, I put my socket over there, connect the adapter over there, I get switch from there. No, it's not that transactional. The Guru is both a person and a principle. There is Guru as a Vyakti and Guru as a Tattva. And the Guru Tattva is manifested to us through the Guru as the Vyakti. So, now I am not going to go too much into the relationship between the principle and the person. Because that itself is a whole big subject. But our understanding is that whether it is a Guru or whether it is Krishna or whether it is Radharani. There is a principle and there is a person. So like we have the three tattvas, Jiva Tattva, Shambhu Tattva and Vishnu Tattva and there is the whole Shakti Tattva. So Radharani is the man, Radharani is actually non-different from that Shakti Tattva. So there is the principle of Radharani. So the person Radharani is, although she may be, pre, she may not be present, but as the principle, she is very much present. So we will look at the three things which I said. We will look at, now what does the principle mean? Radharani as a principle is non-different from Bhakti. She is the embodiment of the highest devotion. Mm -hmm. So Bhakti means love for the Lord. So she is the exemplar of exemplar means the example the per example can be an object but when the example is present in a person the word is used as the exemplar one who exemplifies so she is the exemplar of the highest devotion but she is not just that so this understanding would be like say one devotee has some devotion another devotee has some devotion another devotee has some devotion and Radharani has the highest devotion. This is one understanding. Exemplar of the highest devotion. 
but radharani is not just that radharani is the source of all devotion in everyone whoever has any devotion that comes from radharani yashoda mai's devotion comes from krishna no it comes from radharani she it is for krishna it comes from radharani mm. the gopas devotion it comes from krishna even arjuna's devo no it comes from radharani it is for krishna it comes from radharani so in this understanding it's not just a hierarchy that there are many devotees with different degrees of devotion and actually radharani is the source for everyone radharani is not just the topmost devotee she is the source of the devotion of everyone and from that understanding if we consider bhakti is very much present in the bhagavad gita in fact we'll talk about this principle a little we'll come back to this point as principle in the bhagavad gita bhakti is not only present but bhakti is explained established and emphasized the bhagavad gita does a lot of things it explains bhakti it establishes the position of bhakti and emphasizes that this is what arjuna should be doing so for example it explains what is bhakti so if we consider 9 13 14 or 10 chapter 9 to 12 verses chatur shloki the last three verses even the first verse also but it's the last three verses satatam mahatmanas tum aham parta satam kirtayan tum aham these are all explaining what is bhakti hmm? then krishna establishes bhakti hmm? the potency of bhakti the unique potency of bhakti krishna establish especially establishes from 920 to 34 and then he emphasizes bhakti as the the way that is recommended for arjuna categorically that is 1866 which is 1866 sarva dharman parityajya mam ekam sharanam raja so krishna is saying that i have taught you many paths over arjuna i have analyzed many paths but now i am recommending to you bhakti just forget everything else so from this perspective if we consider that the bhagavad gita analyzes various paths and then emphasizes bhakti as the highest and bhakti is non different from radharani so in one sense you can say the gita whole gita is krishna's glorification of radharani Hmm? <laughs> so in the entire bhagavad gita by establishing the glory of bhakti krishna is establishing the glory of radharani so now in different forums glorification has to be done in different ways hmm? like say if we want to glorify our spiritual master and the vyas puja offering will glorify the spiritual master in one way but if we have some if we are told to talk about our spiritual master in some to some new people we will introduce and glorify them in a different way if it's a group of business people will glorify in a different way maybe if we got it's a nationalistic audition we might glorify in a different way so the glory is to be established in different ways in different places now in the bhagavad gita krishna is speaking at a particular forum for a particular purpose and that forum is the battlefield the purpose is to guide arjuna to make the right choice prachami tvam dharma sammudha cheta arjuna is asking what is dharma so so generally speaking whenever any glorification is to be done it has to be done in a appropriate way so appropriate to the forum 
whatever the four two things upward forum and purpose where are we speaking and what is expected from us over there so here if krishna starts speaking about radharani the person that would be tangential that would be irrelevant but in krishna's heart radharani is always present and he is glorifying radharani according to the place by glorifying the process of bhakti so among all processes krishna establishes bhakti as supreme there are many verses in this but especially 1866 is the most clear and categorical and in fact from this perspective if we see the entire bhagavad gita becomes extremely rasik it becomes extremely relishable so suppose now somebody has to introduce their spiritual master say to a, it's a it's a elite business forum maybe the top uh, the ceos of the top 500 fortune 500 companies and the person who's introducing is also a ceo of a fortune 500 company now suppose when they have to introduce the spiritual master now instead of introducing the spiritual master they start speaking their own glories hey say what is going on why are you speaking about yourself and then that person speaks about you know i have actually opened this company i have this much i done this much i do this much philanthropic work and then that person says why get all my inspiration from this person so <laughs> so like that in the bhagavad gita krishna speaks his own glories for the purpose of glorifying bhakti krishna is speaking his glories but that is not because he is an ego maniac i have to brag about myself all the time no krishna speaks his glories to glorify the process of fixing one's mind on him if you see that way from that perspective some people say that krishna is you know krishna is glorifying himself too much in the bhagavad gita but actually he is not you see if we consider the bhagavad gita has how many chapters 18 and how many divisions in the chapters three divisions i already showed that okay 6 12 now then you even know what the these three divisions broadly refer to okay karma yog bhakti yog and gyan yog well um, yes partly it is true but the way it is is if you look at the flow chapter 1 to 6 the flow is actually karma yoga through dhyan yoga to bhakti yoga chapter if you see karma yoga is described in primarily in chapters 2 to 5 chapter 6 is dhyan yoga and chapter 6 47 if you see is clearly bhakti yoga so in one sense here krishna is telling arjuna about the path and is pointing to bhakti towards the end it is an emphasized bhakti so much over here and similarly 13 to 18 if you see here krishna is talking about gyan yoga but he culminates in bhakti yoga if you see both ways he does it brahma bhuta prasanna atma but then after that says mad bhaktim labhate param so if you go towards 1854 that is the till that point in 1854 and 55 krishna is systematically analyzing and taking towards from the analytical way to the devotional way and after that from 1856 onward krishna is simply giving a summary so there is directly bhakti yoga 1856 till the end 1872 is directly bhakti yoga but if you consider when krishna is describing other paths when krishna is describing karma yoga when krishna is describing gyan yoga that is the first six chapters and the last six chapters there If you consider chapters one to six, Krishna hardly ever talks about his own position. If Krishna had been interested in speaking about his own glories, like some people, uh, they are very insecure. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about the demoniac qualities. Talks about three qualities: dambho, darpo, abhimanascha. Now they can three can seem very similar, but there is. 
significant difference between them. That is, abhiman means one gets one gets great delight in being honored. Hmm? Abhiman. Man is different from Abhiman. Yeah, one gets very great delight. One is like Abhinivesh, that's absorption. So Abhiman is being absorbed, obsessed with considerations of honor. Hmm? So Man is okay, everybody needs to some basic level of respect. But Abhiman means one is obsessed about that. Hmm? Because light is obs because of that they are obsessed. Hmm? But Darpa is what? At least in Abhiman, one is seeking glorification, praise for qualities one has. But in Dambha, Dambho Darpa Abhimanascha, in Dambha, one seeks praise for qualities one doesn't have also. Hmm? That means, some people learn a few lines of Sanskrit and they say, Oh, you are such a Sanskrit scholar. Yeah, I am a Sanskrit scholar. <laughs> so, <laughs> like that. So, that is Dambha. You know, there is Dambho Bhava. There was a demon in Krishna, in Mahabharata. So, Dambha is seeking praise for what one doesn't even have. Mm -hmm. And Darpa is, is, in one sense, anxiety to broadcast one's glories. Hmm? So a, the second and third seem similar, but the third is, one is simply seeing the whole world in terms of who is respecting me, who is going to offer me respect, who is not offering me respect. That's absorbed in that. But Darpa is more, that is the chronic anxiety. So this, these are the people who are very insecure. If I come into a room, and if people don't know who I am, then people say, am I somebody or not? Do I even exist? This is a darpa is associated with a lot of ego that comes out of insecurity. Mm -hmm. Like some people might be, somebody says, I am an IITN. So, this normal conversation, you know, I graduated from IIT. Okay, I studied in IIT. As an IITN, I know this. This is English, is called name dropping. You know, it's a real subtle name dropping. There's no subtlety in it actually. But some people do name dropping. But because they are so insecure that they want their position to be known all the time. But Krishna is not like that at all. See, if you see, we will not go too much into this, but I will just talk from the first six chapters point of view. I will not go to the last six chapters. But in the first six chapters, when Krishna is talking about the primarily about Karma Yoga, then Dhyan Yoga and then Bhakti Yoga, he hardly ever mentions his position. Krishna does not have any Dambha, Darpa or Abhimana. That's why if you see, when does Krishna talk about his position? He talks about barely in 2.61. Where he says, Tani Sarvani Sanyami Yukta Sita Mat Paraha. So Krishna is saying that he is not just a teacher of sense control, but actually to complete the teaching. How do you control your senses? You have to fix the senses on a higher reality. So there only to complete the teaching, Krishna is mentioning his, pointing to his position. Similarly, if you can say third chapter, he mentions his position in 322-24. When he's talking about how every, especially leaders have to act in a responsible way. Yad yad Therefore he says, for he says that, even I, yadi hamna varteyam jatu karmanya tandrataha, that I also do my work very, very scrupulously. There he is mentioning. Then 3.30, he mentions just briefly when karma yoga is to be practiced, ultimately, mai sarvani karmani. That you have to offer the fruits of your karma to me. But apart from that, in the entire, the second chapter has 72 verses, Krishna doesn't mention about himself at all. The third chapter has 43 verses, Krishna doesn't mention himself about himself at all. In the fourth chapter, he just mentions once, or rather he mentions at one place from 4.5 to 4.15, and that is primarily because of the specific question that Arjuna is asking. Arjuna asks, how could you have spoken to the sun god? And in response to that, Krishna says, okay, I exist beyond this world. I am the lord of all living beings. And he talks about his position, but very expertly after that, Krishna comes back to the point of focusing on 
द मैसेज दैट इज गिविंग कर्म योगा फ्रॉम फोर पॉइंट सिक्सटीन अगेन टॉक्स अबाउट गहना कर्मण होगा थी एंड ऑल दैट टीचिंग कम्स अप देन आफ्टर दैट बेली फोर पॉइंट थर्टी फाइव ही मैंशंस जस्ट वन वर्ड मई यज्ञावा न पुनर्मोहम एवं या सी पांडव ये न भूतान यशीसानी द्रक्ष से आत्मन्य थो मई एंड यू आर एनलाइटन यू विल सी ऑल लिविंग द स्पिरिचुअल एंड यू विल सी दैम एज माई पार्ट्स दैट्स ऑल नो आई एम गॉड नथिंग लाइक दैट In fifth chapter, there's only one, five twenty-nine, the last verse, which is talking about the perfection. How does one ultimately get peace? One is detached, one gets peace. He says you can get peace by karma yoga, you can get peace by dhyan yoga, but the ultimate peace will come by bhakti yoga. That's where he mentions gyanatva mam shanti mrachati. Now in the sixth chapter also there are just a few verses before he goes to six forty-seven. Now I don't want to overwhelm that too much, but especially six thirty. is important for us hmm? we'll come back to 630 later yomam pashyati sarvatra sarvam chami pashyati krishna talks about but apart from the six chapter has 47 verses krishna hardly ever mentions about himself in 615 once he mentions mat samstham adigachati but apart from that nothing else so why is krishna doing this 630 631 he talks about it that primarily because he is giving a philosophical teaching how the yogi's vision evolves and then the ultimate vision is they see me everywhere so the point is krishna is not speaking about his glories much only few verses the first six chapters are almost one third of the bhagavata more than one third of the gita gives but in that there are only a dozen verses which krishna is speaking and if arjuna had not asked a specific question at 4.4 question and he would have spoken only four five verses but in the middle six chapters krishna speaks about his glories quite a bit hmm He says, uh, he says, "Raso ho su kaunte." Uh, all that comes up. The ten chapters vibhuti yoga. The nine chapter is also he talks about how prakriti maya adyakshi na prakriti. Now, if you see all this, Krishna speaks. When he starts speaking his own glories, he speaks that primarily because the middle six chapters are about bhakti yoga. And if we are going to practice bhakti, say if we are going to take a job for someone, hmm, especially. If you are going to be the, if somebody is going to be the, the secretary of some big person, hmm, somebody is going to take a job which is directly personally serving someone, then we would like to know what is so special about that person. Why should I serve them? What am I going to gain by serving them? That's natural. And here, when you practice in bhakti, we are not only serving Krishna, we are also loving Krishna. Most people don't love their boss, isn't it? Unless of course they want to marry their boss and become wealthy, then it's a different thing. <laughs> But otherwise, <laughs> most people is is a more a transactional relationship. But even then, they want to know, okay, what is the greatness of the person who I'm serving? So Krishna, throughout the six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, middle six chapters, he speaks about his glories. But he speaks about his glories. primarily to speak about the glory of being devoted to him and that in that sense it shows how krishna is is his krishna's glories they are a building block to bhakti's glories and the glories of bhakti are actually the glories of radharani mm -hmm. so in this way krishna is actually speaking primarily for the purpose of glorifying radharani for the purpose of glorifying bhakti so we, if we come back we, if we get time we'll come back to these verses again this how krishna is doing this but one point i'll make over here that in many ways if you see krishna shows the virata roop hmm it's quite a scary form hmm the virata roop is among the most dramatic chapters in the bhagavad gita hmm like action packed chapter suppose you know somebody now uh, arjuna says can you please show me the universal form now interestingly arjuna is also getting into that mood so at the end of the 11 at the start of the 11th chapter arjuna essentially if you see 11.1 is the same as 1873 1873 the last was that he is speaking nashto moha smriti labda So, oh, my moha is gone, and eleven one is also moho yam vigato mama. My moha is gone, 
Yatpayoktam vachastena madanugrahaya paramam You have been very merciful to me and the word that you have spoken have freed me from illusion. But he says, now that I am freed from illusion, I want to know more of your glories. So, can you please show me the whole universal form? That, that form by which you pervade all of existence. And Krishna says, okay, I will show you. But Krishna says, Yachanya drashtu michyasi. Jo dekhna chahate ho, or jo dekhna nahi chahate, wo bhi dikhaunga mein. <laughs> what you have asked for and what you have not asked for. I will show you something extra. So the universal form, it can refer to two different things. Universal form is generally the form spread across space. The form pervading all of space. Universe is spread across. The, the, the form spread across space is what Krishna has shown in the past. This form spread across space. Ye form, before this Krishna has shown to several other people. Who all he has shown? Duryodhan. That is just recently. Then apart from that, Keshodamai. Yes. But now when Krishna shows the extra, I will show to you. What he shows is the form spread across space and time. That time is the Kala Rupa. This Kala Rupa when he is showing, he is actually showing something which is not shown to Duryodhan before. That's why if you see right in the beginning when Krishna shows the universal form in, in the 11th chapter 15th verse. Arjuna has identified Pashyami Vishveshwara Vishwarupa. I am seeing your universal form and this mythos me. I am thrilled, I am astounded. He uh, is appreciating that. But then, by the time he comes to 11.30 and then 31. 11.30 says, I am scared. And then he says, Akya Himeko Bhavan Ugra Rupo. He just now said that you are the you are the universal form. Now he's asking, who are you? Akya I am asking you. And his the Sanskrit word Bhavan is also like a respectful second person. You know, we pick up the phone, just maybe on a weekend watching TV, enjoying the phone ring, and it's our boss. Huh? Boss hai. Uh, kar sakta hu? <laughs> so that two becomes up. So like that. What happens is that Tom becomes Bhavan. <laughs> Even when Arjuna surrenders to Krishna, Pruchami Tom Dharma Sammudha Chetaha. But when he has seen this universal form, Akya Himeko Bhavan Ugra Rupo. Aap kaun ho? Now, <laughs> why is he asking Aap kaun ho? He's already said this is Vishwarupa. But this is a part of the Vishwarupa that he has never seen before. Like suppose, you know, we meet an old friend after 20-30 years and we are going along for a walk. Just nicely chatting. And then, suddenly a dozen thugs attack us. And before we know what's happening, our friend just exhibits some martial art moves and all those thugs are on the ground. We turn around, aap kaun ho? Who are you? You know? No, when we say, then he says, I am your friend. That's not my question. So, so who is this person who is a uh, martial arts? He says, oh, you know, see, uh, I, in the last several years I learned uh, karate, I'm a black belt karate. Oh, okay. So you see, that's why when Arjuna asks, Akhya Himeko Bhavanu Guru, Krishna doesn't say, I am Krishna. Krishna doesn't say, I am Vishwarupa. Because Arjuna is asking, who is this unknown that I am seeing in you? And that's what the Krishna's reply. Kalosmi Lokakshay Krit Pravriddho Time I am the destroyer of the worlds So this Kala Rupa is Adrushta Purvam It has never been shown before Now, why does Krishna show this, this Kala Rupa? Actually after seeing this Kala Rupa Arjuna says You know, you, you showed me what I asked for It doesn't say you showed me extra He said thank you But I want to see your two-handed form now Saumya Rupa and then Krishna teases Arjuna a little bit Krishna says this form that you 
cannot see it after great performance of austerities. You cannot see this form after doing, uh, studying Vedas. He says, okay, okay, but I don't want to see it anymore. <laughs> I want to see a two-handed form. And then Krishna, he is actually, the sequence is Krishna is showing the universal form. And then, now we have Krishna. From Krishna, the universal form is shown. And that is most of the 11th chapter. Then, in briefly, there is the Vishnu form that is shown, the four-handed Vishnu form. Hmm? And then from that Vishnu form, again, the Krishna form is, it returns to the Krishna form. And when this form is seen, that is the time Arjuna becomes peaceful, Arjuna becomes joyful. And then Krishna says, this is the highest form. The universal form is rare, but this is the highest. Deva apyasya rupasya nityam darshana kangshinaha. That even the gods long to see this form. And then the whole Prabhupada, the last verse in the 11th chapter is 11.55. And Prabhupada writes, this is the sum and substance of the Bhagavad Gita. Now we could say, we don't really quote this verse very often. 1866 we quote, Man we quote, there are so many other verses we quote. Even Prabhupada himself did not quote this verse very often. He says, Mat karma krun mat parmo mat bhakta sanga varjita niruvairah sarva vedhuteshu yaha samameti pandava. Now, what is the point of saying this is the sum and substance? It is actually through this demonstration of the Virata Rupa, that some people are very impressed when they see giant manifestations. But Krishna is saying that Virat Rupa and admiration for that, that is nothing as compared to my two-handed form and devotion to that two-handed form. So Krishna's Virat Rupa Darshan is also for glorifying Bhakti Yoga. That is the purpose of that display. Like, uh, you show something very great, powerful, you know, a very powerful manifestation we show, and then we show a small manifestation. This small manifestation is actually the source of that, and worshipping this small manifestation is the biggest. Now, Krishna is not small, Krishna is all pervading. But from a material perspective, Krishna's two handed form might not seem as impressive in terms of size as the two handed form. But the Prabhupada's mood of devotion is so amazing in the Bhagavad Gita. Sometimes we feel that Bhagavad Gita is just like a preliminary book. For many of us, Bhagavad Gita is a book for teaching to others, not for studying ourselves. <laughs> Bhagavad Gita, yeah, Bhagavad Gita course karna hai, Bhagavad Gita distribute karna hai. Why do you think Bhagavad Gita, rasa, will get in future? We'll get Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charita, Amrita, all this. Well, yes, those books have rasa, but the Bhagavad Gita also has the rasa. See, if you see the le chapter 11, what is happening? It is God is displaying His opulence. Hmm? His opulence of Vishwarupa. And Prabhupada writes in the start of the chapter itself, a devotee is not interested in such a godless display of opulence. Now God is displaying his opulence and Prabhupada has the audacity to say this is a godless display of opulence. How can Prabhupada say that? That this is a godless display of opulence. So Prabhupada is actually manifesting the mood of devotion over here. In the mood of devotion, a devotee is not really interested in the all-pervading form of the Lord. Because a devotee wants to love the Lord, serve the Lord. And if Krishna is everywhere and Krishna is everything, you know, how can we serve Him? So a devotee is not interested in that kind of form. And that's why there are times when Prabhupada says, especially for example towards the end 1865, He's also manifesting the mood of Radharani. He says, Man mana bhav. So he says, don't even fix your form, mind on forms like Ram or Narayan or Vishnu. Fix your mind only on Krishna. But this is Prabhupada also, in his, in his purport and his explanations, is manifesting that mood. Explicitly, Prabhupada was very conservative in talking about Radharani. In fact, in the entire Bhagavad Gita, as it is, it's almost 900 pages, hmm. There's, how many times do you think Radharani is referred to? Directly, directly. Directly then, Radharani, directly. Not the, that is not a direct reference. 
किया यस ओनली वंस तब तक आंचे न गौरांगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी ओनली वन प्रोपर इज ऑफरिंग दैट प्रेयर ही मेंशन राधा रानी एक्सप्लिसिटली डजंट मेंशन एनीवेयर बट इन टर्म्स द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ राधा रानी इज राधा रानी इज भक्ति एंड दैट इज ग्लोरिफाइड थ्रू आउट द गीता even when the gita seems to be talking about unrelated themes that's why if you see arjuna understand what krishna is doing and as, well, as soon as this virat rupa darshan gets over immediately krishna is asked by arjuna in the 11th chapter so 12th chapter he says evam satat yukta ye bhakta stam paribhasate ye chapya aksharam nirdesham tesham ke yoga vittamah so he is asking is the impersonal worship better or the personal worship better so why speak about that अभी विराट रूप का भी इंपर्सनल कहां से आ गया इट डजेंट सीम टू बी रिलेटेड बट द आइडिया इज कृष्णा इज कैचिंग ऑन दिस थीम दैट स्वीटनेस इज बेटर देन ग्रेटनेस दैट टू हैंड स्वीट टू हैंडेड फॉर्म इज मच मच रिच इज मच स्वीटर मच रिचर मच हायर देन देन द ऑल परवेडिंग फॉर्म सो दैट थीम ऑफ स्वीटनेस इज एक्चुअली ग्रेटर देन ग्रेटनेस that theme in chapter 11 is for the materially all pervading manifestation the materially all pervading manifestation is the virata roopa and then arjuna talks about what about the spiritually all pervading manifestation the spiritually all pervading manifestation is the brahma jyoti brahman so he says krishna clearly establishes that maya veshya mano ye maam nitya yukta upasate that those who worship my personal form are the highest so both from the materially all pervading the spiritually all pervading the idea is krishna is the highest no. krishna is the highest and worship of krishna is bhakti is the highest now having said this that i talk about the principle now let's talk about the mood of radharani and then i'll talk about the remembrance of radharani with which we'll conclude now the mood of radharani is seen in several verses in the bhagavad gita 630 is one verse 630 is yo maam pashyati sarvatra sarvam cha mai pashyati tasya ham na pranashami sacha me na pranashyati one who sees me everywhere and who sees everything in me such a person is never lost to me and such a person i am never lost to them now this is actually this in many ways this verse is describing the gopis when they were separated from krishna in the rasleela they were running around here and there they were looking at the trees they were looking at tulsi they were looking at the birds they were looking at the sky they were looking at the moon they were looking at the grass they were looking at the ground they were looking at the yamuna but they were not seeing any of those things they're saying is krishna here they're asking those creatures have you seen krishna have you seen krishna have you seen krishna so what is later described as chaitanya mahaprabhu state of consciousness sthavar jangam na dekhi na dekhi tara murti sarvatra hai nij ishta deva spurti so it is the gopis are yoginis of devotion hmm? they, are, they are the topmost yogis that the yoginis of devotion and that is what is referred to in this verse that they see me everywhere and the key point is that they see me everywhere and they are never lost to me nor am i ever lost to them now what does it mean actually the gopis had lost krishna but although krishna had disappeared externally krishna had appeared internally in their hearts even more and that's why in the padyavali in one verse radharani is reflecting and says that you know that separation from krishna is painful she still i prefer separation than union this is why because in union i can see krishna only in one place but in separation i see krishna everywhere so <laughs> so yo ma pashyati sarvatra this is not just a vague idea that oh god is everywhere this is not krishna is saying it is not seeing my energy everywhere it is not just see everything and remember me krishna said they see me everywhere mam pashyati not mam prakriti pashyati or anything like that 
Okay, so that is this is that is a difference between remembering and seeing. They are similar, but they are different. We can see everything and we can remember. Like Prabhupada said, this the sound system. We remember this is meant for Krishna's service. The sound system is made of material, which is Krishna's energy. That is remembrance of remembering Krishna. But Krishna is not talking here about remembering. He is saying seeing, pashyati. So this is the state of Radharani. And when Uddhava came to Vrindavan to try to give a message to the go, to the Vajvasis and especially the Gopis. Now Uddhava had sir, heard something about the Vrajavasis, he had heard something from Krishna himself, he had heard something from Balram, he had heard something from the from Rohini. He also, he wanted, to, he also wanted to see what's, uh, what is so special about the Vrajavasis. Why does Krishna care so much for them? It's like you know, if we have, we know one devotee is a very scholarly devotee. And that devotee says, you know, that, that, that devotee says, some other devotee. That devotee is a scholar like no one else. Yeah, really, if you appreciate the devotee, what is so special? You want to know. So like that, Uddhava knew the, that Rohini was, had great devotion. Balram, of course, is the Lord himself, but he had a great devotion. But they were all glowing, glorifying the Vrajavasis. What is so special about their devotion? And when he came there, he saw Yashudamai Nanda Maharaj crying, just stunned with their devotion. But then he met the gopis. And at least the gopis met him, but as one gopi, she didn't even meet him. And that was Radharani. Radharani, she just was, she just stayed at a distance and it is, she was speaking to a bumblebee. You are the unreliable servant of an unreliable master. Now, some, some people, you, know, you speak directly also, they don't understand. And some people you speak indirectly and so they understand. So when she was speaking like this, now she was speaking to Uddhava about Krishna. And she was so absorbed that Uddhava was astounded. You know, this level of every Vrajavasi that he met it was astonishing. But it's like, you know, astonishment, astonishment squared, astonishment cubed, astonishment quadrupled. But when he saw Radharani, it was astonishment raised to the power of infinity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just couldn't appreciate it. That is just, she's in the forest and Krishna has not been there for years. And still she's so absorbed in Krishna that she just can't think of anything else at all. He's thinking about Krishna. So that was yo, that is Yoma Ampashita. She's a bumblebee. And she is not just talking to the bumblebee. She's not that she's remembering some past time she performed with the bumblebee with, uh, with Krishna when the bumblebee was there. She's actually seeing Krishna, then she's talking to him as if it's Krishna over there. So it's she's speaking to the bumblebee as a servant of Krishna, but he's speaking as if Krishna is hearing that. And that's why she becomes when the when the bumblebee flies away, oh, he may go and tell Krishna all this. No, no, I'm angry, I didn't want to speak all this to Krishna. She becomes panicky over there. Now, after that, if we consider 9.13, I mentioned earlier, this Mahatmanas Tumam Partha Daivim Prakriti Mahashutaha. So that reference to Daivi Prakriti, that is, that is Radharani. That is a divine nature. But as another aspect is Bhajanti Ananya Manaso. That Ananya, Anya is alternative. Ananya is no alternative. Bhajan, they worship with the, with the mind not going towards any alternatives. So, one time Narad Muni came to Vrindavan. And Vrindavan is normally the place of activity. There is there's butter being churned, there is the cows going out, there is somebody cooking. But, when you, uh, it was near the, near the outskirts of Vrindavan and he saw complete silence. Hey, hey, this doesn't seem like Vrindavan. What's going on over here? It, like say evening Aarti is supposed to be going on. The temple all complete silence. Hey, something is wrong. And then he, he saw all the gopis were sitting in yogic postures. And they were doing dhyan. He said, what's going on over here? What's going on? So then, the gopis slightly opened and says, what's going on? Can you see we are meditating? 
We are doing yoga. He says, why? No, because our mind is agitated. We want to calm our mind. Okay. Okay. Uh, they saying our mind is agitated. We want to calm our mind. Okay. So, what is your mind agitated by? He says, it is agitated by thoughts of Krishna. And we want to calm our mind by forgetting Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> so, normal yogis, they practice yoga to meditate on Krishna. But the gopis, they were meditating to try to forget Krishna. But they would close their eyes, sit down meditation, take deep breaths. And the more they would try to think about something else, from wherever it goes, their mind would come back to Krishna. You know, they would hear a bird chirping and they would say, Oh, we were, in, we were performing this Leela with Krishna, at that time the bird was chirping. And suddenly one of the gopis started, you remember that past time? Do you remember we did that and Krishna spoke that? And all the gopis start talking. And somebody, hey, what happened? We forgot to meditate. We became yoga brushed. <laughs> they would again sit down to meditate. So for them, ananya manaso, it was, it didn't require any endeavor for them. It was the endeavor was to forget Krishna, but their mind was effortlessly moving toward Krishna. And then the next verse is, Yatan satatam kirtayantoma yatantasya dhudhavrataha. The gopis endeavor with great determination also. When Radharani is cooking for Krishna, see in the spiritual world there is chintamani prakarakha sadmashu kalpa vruksha. The kalpa vruksha. The gopis could just say to the, the kalpa vruksha, you know, we want to serve Krishna a delicious feast, please provide, feast. Please provide the feast. Please provide the gulab jamun and this and that and that. And the kalpa vruksha will provide. But not one of the gopis ever does that. When Ra- if we go to Pavan Sarol in Davan, there are, there are 50 stalls on which Radharani is cooking simultaneously. No, Radharani is the ultimate multitasker. <laughs> <laughs> she is multitasking, cooking 50 items at the same time. And why? Because she wants to offer the best to Krishna. So, Dhudavrataha. The gopis, they maintain their life even after Krishna departed from the world. So, see, determination normally for most of us, we need determination because our mind and senses are distracted, because the world is distracting and that's why we need determination to stay fixed in the service to Krishna. But for Radharani, there was no, the mind and senses are completely absorbed in Krishna. But for her, the determination is required to maintain faith in Krishna even after Krishna has abandoned them. See, there are many kinds of... Why are the gopis considered the highest devotees? There are many reasons for that. But one of the reasons is that generally say, if we try to do something for someone, say, we to over-distribute books, but you know, that's not my nature, I can't do it. You say, it's too difficult, I'll not do it. Okay, okay, but still I'll try something. Thoda, the determination is required. But we go and this place, you know, people are people not unreceptive, they're disrespectful, they're insulting. I don't want to do it. So generally, when we are, say, if we are here, and we are trying to do a service to please someone, hmm? if there's difficulty in the service, then we need determination to push through the difficulty. So difficulty is like an obstacle, and we want to force our way through the difficulty. So that determination is required. But you know the greatest determination is required when we face obstacles not on the path of our service but when there are obstacles from the very object of our service. The very person whom we are serving starts criticizing us, starts condemning us. And you start thinking, why am I even serving? Isn't it? So, obstacles on the path of service we can deal with. But if there are obstacles from the object of service itself, then we start thinking, why am I serving? So, for example, Prahlad's devotion is great. That he faced a huge obstacle, there was a risk to his life. And yet he continued the service, continued his devotion. For the gopis, their obstacle was Krishna himself. Isn't it? Krishna called them to the forest for Rasdila and Krishna abandoned them. 
दैट्स वाई दिस पति सुतन्वय भ्रातृ बांधवान अति विलांग ते अंत्य अच्युतागता वी गिव अप आर एंटायर फैमिली टू कम टू यू कृष्णा एंड गतिविदस्तव उद्गीत मोहित यू कॉल्ड एज बाय प्लेइंग योर फ्लूट एंड कितव योषित कस्त्य जेनशी हाउ कुड यू अबैंडन अस लाइक दैट दैट टू ऑल एट नाइट ऑल ऑफ अस अलोन kitav yoshitas we are we are just we just young women helpless how could you abandon us like that and the gopis are angry so in the narad bhakti sutra it is said the test of love is that there is every reason to give up that love and one doesn't give it up then there is real love that now nobody had as much reason to give up krishna as the gopis the gopis give up everything for krishna and generally speaking what happens is when we do something for krishna we expect 10 times more from him that's one of the more reasons why people practice bhakti isn't it bhagwan mein itni puja ki aap kab dene wale hmm that is general idea but here and if some problems come we say why is god letting this happen to me but the problem at least we understand the problems are coming from the world when the problem comes from god directly oh it's very very difficult to bear that so the gopi is their drudhavata is to stay faithful to krishna even when krishna abandons them and that's why ashlishya va padaratam vinashtumam that even if you crush us under our your feet even if you abandon us adarshanam You just do not give us your darshan mar mahatam you just shatter our heart by that but will be even then mat prananathas tus eva na paraha you are always our master you are always the lord of our life so that mood is exemplified by the gopis and especially by radharani that even there can be rejection even from krishna and still the devotee doesn't reject krishna that is the highest test of love so rejected by krishna now they are not actually rejected but at least externally rejected by krishna but didn't reject krishna mm-hmm. most people is exactly opposite it's when they are rejected by the world they turn toward krishna mm-hmm. but here the gopi is they turned away by krishna and still they stay with krishna and that brings us to the last verse which we'll discuss today this is 1866 1866 sarva dharman parityajya maam ekam sharanam vraja now at one level literally this verse is demonstrated by the gopis sarva dharman parityajya give up all dharma and surrender to me now I was at a Gita recitation event on Gita Jayanti in America, and there they were. Then some kids were. It's not the, the Hindu event, not a Iskcon event, and some kids were reciting the Bhagavad Gita. So they recited various key verses from the Gita, and when they came to this verse, they recited Sarva Adharman Parityajya Mame Kam Sharanam Raja. So after that, I asked the organizer. Why do you say Sarva Adharman Parityajya? So he told me about some book. See, now the Prabhupada wrote Bhagavad Gita as it is. It has become very widespread because of the devotees of his con, because of the because of the sheer bhakti that is full. It is permeated with it. So there are some people who write piggyback on Prabhupada's popularity. That means you know they take it. And so this person has written a book called Bhagavad Gita as it was. <laughs> <laughs> and in that he has done reasoning he says that you sanskrit is very complicated language and small oversight can make a big mistake so he says over the centuries when we people were writing the bhagavad gita because there is no printing so you have to rewrite you have to do pathantar so he says somebody over the centuries forgot the a oh. so it was sarva adharman parityajya but it became dharman Since Krishna came to establish dharma, why will he tell anyone to give up dharma? 
So it was actually Adharma and Parijit. That is Bhagavad Gita as it was. Well, that only shows how your intelligence was, is and will be. <laughs> well, just speculating. If you see, the dharma that Krishna is referring to over there is in response to Arjuna's question. Puchami tuam dharma sammuda cheta. What is the right thing to do? Now if somebody is already asking what is the right thing to do, you don't have to tell them, don't do the wrong thing. Isn't it? If some, say, if somebody goes to America for the first time and they ask what are the traffic rules over here? Their, their question itself is what are the traffic rules? You don't have to tell them, don't break the traffic rules. They are already wanting to know what are the traffic rules. So, Arjuna, when he is asking about dharma, the right thing to do, he doesn't have to be told sarva dharma and prithij. Is it? Already he is asking about dharma only. So, what does this mean? That, you know, when there is sacrifice for God, there is sacrifice for God, first thing is, we give up the bad things. You know, like we have the four regulated principles. The habits, the things that are bad in our life, we give them up for God. That is the beginning. It's important to do that, at least. But after that, we should be ready to give up even the good things. If that is, yeah, give up sinful activities. But, sometimes for God's sake, we may even have to give up the virtuous activities. Yeah, I'm doing a good job and I'm earning a good amount of money. But I want to serve Krishna full time. Now, doing a job is not a bad thing. But I want to serve Krishna full time. So, I will I'll give up my job. So, giving up a good thing may also be required. So, when Sarva Dharma and Paritija Krishna is saying, Krishna is saying also, Arjuna, yes, it may be your dharma to uh, take care of your relatives. That is your Kula Dharma. But give up that dharma because Maam Ekam Sharanam So, it is Sarva Dharma and Paritija. And this mood is actually demonstrated by the gopis the most. The gopis, when Krishna calls them at night, at that time, in a conservative society like that, if a woman goes out alone at night to be with some man, now she is ruined socially. It's like committing social suicide. And then the gopis left their home to go to Krishna. You know, they didn't have any plan B. Now what am I going to do? No. They just, Krishna has called us. We have to go to him right away. Mami kam sharnam raja. So, of course, aham to aham saru pape bhyo moksha ishami. I'll free you from all sinful reactions. So, Krishna protected the gopis. What Krishna did was, when the gopis ran away, Krishna and Vrindavan created replicas of the gopis. They were like Maya gopis or Chaya gopis. And they were all present at home. And the Vrajivasis thought, oh, Krishna called and the gopis wanted to go, but he stopped them and they didn't go. And so, in this way, Krishna protected the reputation of the gopis. But the gopis did not know in advance that Krishna was going to protect their reputation. That Krishna did it out of his own reciprocation with their surrender. And the gopis are the topmost embodiment of this principle. Sarva dharman pratyaja maam ekam sharanam raja. For Krishna's sake, one can give up the bad, one can even give up the good. Now that doesn't mean we all have to do this, but Maamekam Sharanam Raja is more important. Srila Prabhupada is also like that. You now according to traditional rules of sannyas, you know, one, especially, you could take it both ways. Many people when they grow old, they take a Kshetra Sannyas vow. I am going to go to Rindavan, I will go to Kashi, I will go to such a holy place, I will never leave that place, I will just die in that place. So. Or people say that, okay, you know, sannyasi shouldn't travel outside the country, they should not travel across the oceans. But Prabhupada, Sarva Dharaban Parityacha. Forget that. Why? Maam Ekam Sharnam. I have to fulfill Krishna's mission. That is the most important thing. Now, this word Vraja that comes over there, I'll conclude with that. Now, when we use, see the word Vraja, what does that mean? So, see, there, there is, when we look at words, there are connotations. Okay, let me, I'll make this more complicated, then I'll make it simple. Hmm, first, there are denotations, then there are connotations. So, denotation means, what does it mean? What does it denote? Hmm? 
and connotation is what does it remind us of connote what does it remind us of mm -hmm. so now in terms of denotation vraja actually is referring to the mode of surrender some people say that actually this vraja means to go hmm? so vraja in terms of denotation it can mean go and some people say this means that krishna is saying that i am not the ultimate reality there is some ultimate reality beyond me and you should go and surrender to that reality that's why he says go hmm? ma vraja but if that were the case then what does arjuna do does arjuna go and surrender to some reality up beyond krishna oh i do sharanam vraja so bye bye krishna i'll go and say, go to the forest and surrender to the brahman or something like that krishna does not do that sorry arjuna does not do that arjuna also says karishye vachanam tava so that vraja meaning go to go if that go refers to some other reality beyond krishna that doesn't make any sense from the context uh, but the word vraja in the bhagavad gita is also used to mean move hmm? in fact the vrindavan is called vraja why vraja vraja is the place of movement and if you consider this say with this same meaning arjuna has himself used that word in his question 2.54 sita pragyasya ka bhasha samadhi stasya keshava stiddhi kim prabhasheta vrajeta kim so in one sense the exact word that krishna arjuna has used how do the self realized people move so krishna is saying arjuna move now so it is that you have to surrender to me but surrender is not turning away from the world to become absorbed in god surrender is turning to the world in a mood of service to god so krishna and arjuna are here arjuna has turned toward krishna to talk with him and krishna is saying turn away from me turn toward the world focus on the world so go and do my will in the world so the vraja it refers to the mode of surrender it refers to the mode of surrender not the object of devotion there is no object of devotion other than krishna that is to be worshiped hmm so that's one point but in terms of connotations so denotation it refers to move arjuna act in surrender to me but in terms of connotation it is very clearly a reference to vrindavan vraja in the mood of vraja you should surrender now like sometimes the there is in english there is a word called allusion hmm say if say to if say we had a conversation with someone hmm say i had a conversation with a with rupanuga prabhu where i use the word foolish hmm and then i use that same word in the class and then i glance at him so i am using the word with one meaning when i am using it in the class but when i am talking with him then the both of us will remember oh foolish okay both of us will smile because there is a private reference over there that word for everyone else it may not remind them of that but for those who know it will remind them of something else so like that this vraja that krishna is talking about sarva dharma and paritya jamam ekam sharanam he could have used any other word over there but it's a allusion to the gopis it's allusion to vrindavan it's allusion to radharani that that just as the gopis gave up all of the dharma <coughs> all of the dharmas and surrendered you also surrender to me like like that all of you should surrender to me like that i will protect just as i protected the gopis so now this 1866 is the charam shloka of the bhagavad gita ramacharya calls this as the concluding the crest jewel verse and in that crest jewel verse krishna is smuggling in a reference to radharani <laughs> referring to vrindavan ultimately in vrindavan it is krishna remembers everybody in vrindavan but he remembers radharani the most and it is she who exemplifies that mood of devotion like no one else and it is that it is if you see it from this perspective you know krishna is referring to vraja then the next works makes next verse makes immediate sense 
What is the next verse? Idam te na tapaskaya na bhaktaya kadachana na chashu shrushave vachyam na chamam yobhisu yati He is saying that don't speak about these to everyone. Don't speak about this to those who are not austere. To those who are not having a service attitude. Don't speak about these to those who are not having devotion. Especially not speak about these to those who are envious. Now Krishna is speaking the whole Bhagavad Gita to enlighten humanity. And he says, Idam te na tapaskaya. Don't speak this. So this Idam does not refer to the entire Bhagavad Gita. The Atma Gyan can be given to everyone. The Karma Yoga can be talked about to everyone. Even Bhakti Yoga can be talked about to everyone. But this highest revelation that you know you can give up everything and surrender to Krishna. Hmm? And Krishna will protect you. This is a confidential message. This is not meant to be a license that everybody abandon their responsibilities and think, oh, Krishna will protect me. No, I can do Papa and Krishna will protect me. Not like that. So, Krishna when he is talking about Radharani, he is saying, don't talk about Radharani to everyone. Don't talk about this highest devotion to everyone. And in this way, the whole Bhagavad Gita contains many indirect references. But when we see them, that this in the in the thread of the thought of the Bhagavad Gita, and especially when we see them in the in terms of the heart of Krishna, as it is as we know it from Vrindavan, then just as a devotee can see Krishna everywhere, similarly a Gaudiya Vaishnava devotee can see Vrindavan Krishna and can see Radharani everywhere. Now this is a matter of rasa. This is not necessarily a matter of philosophical argument. Now did Krishna in Vraja, did he refer to Vrindavan? Well, you could go into Sanskrit uh, arguments and that's not the point over here. Just like Sthavar when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, whenever he would, coming, while coming to Vrindavan, whenever he would see any hill, he would see it as Govardhan. Any river, he would see it as Jamuna. Any forest, he would see it as Vrindavan. Now, was that forest actually Vrindavan? Well, you could say that then this was Mahaprabhu in Maya then? No. See, the point is, there is Achintya Bheda Bheda over there. Because Mahaprabhu saw it as, saw every forest as Vrindavan, but he didn't stop going to what Vrindavan. Isn't it? <laughs> so, the point over here is, that Mahaprabhu's consciousness was so Krishna Mai, that so filled with Krishna, that any forest would remind him of Krishna. And similarly, now, when we are seeing Radharani in these verses, it's not a matter of philosophy, argument. somebody says, oh, this Raja doesn't refer to Vrindavan. Okay, if that's your mood, that's your mood. We are okay with that. But we see, in terms of our rasa, we see Radharani here, we see Vrindavan here. And just as, I said, I said, I'll repeat this point, just as a devotee of Krishna sees Krishna everywhere. A Gaudiya Vaishnav, in Gaudiya Vaishnavism, I think Raghavad Goswami says that, actually we worship Radharani. And because Radharani loves Krishna, so we offer some respect to Krishna also. <laughs> so, just as a Gaudiya Vaishnav is primarily a devotee of Radharani. So, as Gaudiya Vaishnavas, we see Radharani everywhere. And in this way, we can see Radharani so much filled in the Bhagavad Gita. I'll summarize. We talked about how to see Radharani in the Bhagavad Gita. I talked about how Radharani is the person, the tattva. Then, uh, that she's not just a person, she's also a principle. And then, we talked about how there are <coughs> references and remembrances. Hmm? So, references means, so Tattva, I talked about how the whole Bhagavad Gita, in terms of Tattva is, the purpose of the Gita is to glorify, to establish Bhakti Yoga. I talked about Radharani is non-different from Bhakti. And the purpose of Bhagavad Gita is to establish, then emphasize and explain Bhakti. And thus, the whole Bhagavad Gita is in one sense Krishna's glorification of Radharani. What is the glorification of Bhakti? And we discuss especially how Krishna's glorification of himself is also for the glorification of Radharani. Even Krishna's description of the universal form 
is to highlight his two-handed form and thereby highlight bhakti. That's so 11.55 and then similarly the comparison of the impersonal personal that is also meant to highlight bhakti. And in terms of references we talked about how when Krishna is describing devotees you know those verses we talked about 6.30, 9.13 there are many verses like that but 9.14 Yomam Pashisata, one sees Krishna everywhere. So those verses, they're actually very beautifully describing Radharani. So for us, when Krishna is describing the pure devotees, he is describing Radharani. The gopis had to face the greatest obstacle in their devotion. The obstacle came from the very object of devotion. Krishna rejected them. And still they were determined enough to practice bhakti. And the last we discussed was the remembrance. Now reference and remembrance, the difference is slightly that it is Krishna is describing the gopis and we can see that this is a reference to Krishna. But here Krishna is himself remembering Vrindavan. That was especially 1866. Where the Vraja is an allusion. Not illusion, it's an allusion. Allusion means an indirect reference to Krishna. And for us as Gaudiya Vaishnavas, we see Radharani's presence everywhere. And as we see the Bhagavad Gita also, filled with rich with Radha Tattva. Such is the sublime glory of Krishna and his, his greatest devotee, Srimati Radharani. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Do you have time for questions? Okay. Yes, bro. You have any comments, suggestions, corrections? We have only compliments. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Hare Krishna, Proji. Thank you for this uh, deep class, bro. I have one doubt that how to get this knowledge? Like first, uh, if we read even the scriptures like Bhakti Shastri and this, it it, it it will be like study of Vedas or scriptures like we are studying. So I just want to know how these realizations, because realizations are revealed in heart. So what is the process for that? Because these things are not very clear easily and not clearly revealed anywhere. So how do we realize these things? Satam prasangan mamabira samvido. That actually if you see traditionally, Vedic knowledge in general and Bhakti in particular was primarily transmitted through the oral tradition. In the past, books were very, very difficult to write. And uh, they, even if they could write them, it's a handwriting on leaves, but it's very difficult to reproduce. So books were only for Raji for scholars. And they would study and they would speak. Ordinary people didn't have books so much. So in the past, Bhakti was transmitted primarily through the oral tradition. And that ha that's went on for millennia. Now, books are relatively easily available for us. So we can read books, but what has worked for history, we can't replace that. So we read books as a service and especially for those who are very analytical, intellectual, studying books is important, there is no substitute for that. But largely the rasa of bhakti comes by hearing from devotees. And if you want the best of both worlds, then try to bring the oral and the written tradition together. That means what? That you read a book and then try to find out somebody who has given classes on that book and then exactly okay you it, the reading may be much slower at that time because sometimes in one verse there might be one full class you could read that one verse in maybe five minutes or ten minutes you read the purport also but you spend one hour on that verse because one hour class is there but that will not only help us get rasa but that will also help us understand or he help us see how this same verse can be thought about in so many different ways so living tradition is indispensable there is a literary tradition in terms of books, but there is a living tradition. Both are required. So especially the, the, the life of bhakti comes through the living tradition. 
Now, even when devotees were very new, yes, one year, six months old, when Prabhupada in 1968 had to come to India, Prabhupada didn't say, play my recordings when I'm not there. Prabhupada said, you give classes. Because Prabhupada wanted to establish that example of the living tradition. Of course, we should hear Prabhupada's classes, we should read Prabhupada's books. But the living tradition is extremely important. That's why we, best is we read scrutinizingly and then we hear systematically. And then we will get a very rich understanding of bhakti, of, of the principles of bhakti, of the teachings of scripture, especially the rustic teachings of scripture. Okay? Thank you. Yes, please. Where is the mic? Thank you so much for this wonderful and deep uh, class. My question is that Aapna uh, Bhadada that you said uh, that, uh, that in Bhagavad Gita Krishna says Ye yatha maam prapadhyante taam sadha bhajamyam I will reciprocate as per uh, surrender. So we see that uh, Rishwadama is very loving to Krishna and Krishna shows him universal form. On the other hand uh, Duryodhan was very envious of Krishna and Krishna shows uni universal form. So why he reciprocates say in the same way of two uh, different classes of the well, Krishna is reciprocal, but that does not necessarily mean Krishna is uh, not personal. You may reciprocate with pe different people, and the reciprocity may mean different things. See, when Krishna went to, uh, to, to Hastinapur, it was a last ditch effort to f avoid war. Mm -hmm. And Krishna tried to avoid war or deter Duryodhan from war by offering peace on the most accommodating terms and when that didn't happen then on the other hand Duryodhan tried to arrest Krishna so Krishna showed the universal form to try to put some sense to Duryodhan this is the form you are against do you think you can win now and then at that time Vitrasha requested can I see the form and Krishna said, Krishna granted him that. Now, the Trashtra had never done anything good for Krishna or Krishna's devotees, the Pandavas. He had been, if he had not been an active villain, he, if he had not been an active instigator, he had definitely been a passive consenter in the atrocities against the Pandavas. Then why would Krishna give him eyes to see the universal form? Because Krishna was Vyavasayatmika Buddhi over there. There, when he went to Vrinda, when he went to Hastinapur, his purpose was to avoid war. And if war could not be avoided, his purpose was to establish clearly who was the cause of the war. Hmm? That the war was not caused by the Pandavas. It's not the pa Pandavas were power hungry or battle hungry, battle thirsty. So he established that very clearly. So he's showing the universal form was like a final deterrence. This is what you are against. You still want to fight? Well, the reason said, yeah, Krishna, you show some magic. You know, if I had some time, I would have also learned some magic. And I would also show many magic forms. He caught us by surprise by showing us some magic. That was the magical explanation he came up with. <laughs> you know, <laughs> magical in the sense of foolish explanation. So, I'm using the magical in the sense of completely logical explanation. So, that Krishna showed that the purpose was not so much reciprocating with Duryodhan. It was more trying to avoid war or at least establish who is the cause of the war. Okay. And for Yashoda Maya? Yashoda Maya, it's a part of his Leela. You know, Krishna had this delightful play in Vrindavan where mostly he shows his sweetness. But in between, just to increase the spice of his pastimes, Krishna suddenly shows his greatness. And then when he shows his greatness, he would have bewildered. And again he shows his sweetness. So, that, that is just to increase the flavor of his rasa. Everything that happens in Vrindavan is to increase the flavor of the rasa, to increase the sweetness of the, to increase, not just the sweetness, I would say, increase the, increase the multifariousness of the rasa. Just like when you have a, if you have a feast, if the, if the whole feast is sweet, it will become too sweet. Is it, you need various flavors. So like that, Krishna as a small naughty child is very sweet. But Krishna, the universal form is spicy. So, it's a different flavor. Krishna brings it in sometimes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. 
Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Dhanwar Pranam. Thank you so much for this enlightening lecture, Prabhuji. Uh, Prabhuji, my question is, uh, as we know that uh, Bhagavad Gita was spoken by Vasudeva Krishna, Vasudeva form of Krishna. So, uh, how could he establish Vrajaras? And if he could do it, can other Vishnu forms also establish Vrajaras? Yeah, it's not that they are completely different. It's not like you know, they are divorced from each other and they don't even want to talk about each other. <laughs> it's not like, a, you know, they have the same person in different moods. So Vasudeva Krishna and Vrindavan Krishna are the same person. If you see, in the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, there is also Mahavishnu who takes away Brahmana's children and he says, I just Krishna, I wanted to have your darshan. So, it's thought that these two different personalities of God are completely different. You know, Mahavishnu also wants to have darshan of Krishna because Krishna is so special. So yes, Vasudeva Krishna also is, it's not diff- is, is in some ways different, Achinte Bheda Bheda. He knows, it's the same Krishna, it's just a different mood. But he knows, this Vasudeva Krishna also knows the mood of Vrindavan Krishna. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Prabhupada. Hare Krishna Muji, thank you so much for, me for such a rustic explanation of Bhagavad Gita. I have never ever heard actually this rustic way of uh, Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Prabhupada, my question was from uh, this last point where you explained the uh, connotation and denotation of uh, Vraja. So, uh, I was just thinking that uh, this, uh, like, uh, understanding each and every significance of each and every word in the Shastras uh, would be um, relevant only if we understand that Shastras were also spoken by the person who is being told just like Krishna also in the same way. Uh, Just like Krishna also spoke in the same meters as the verses are there and same words were being used by the Krishna while speaking. So then only it will make uh, some sense. Otherwise, uh, it may also happen that Krishna spoke a message and that was given by Vyasadeva in the verses. So in that case, uh, the analysis of the verse may not be that much of significance. Okay. So, so the question is, you know, did Krishna literally speak exactly the same word that we have in the Bhagavad Gita? Or is it that Krishna spoke a message and then Vyasadeva put it in poetic form? Well, Sridhar Swami analyzes this in his Bhagavatam commentary. And he says, because Vyasadeva is a literary incarnation of the Lord. That is why the... That now, exactly what he says, the words can be translated differently. But broadly what he says is, that the message is not lost. There is no loss in non translation. Now, it is true that... Is it that in the past, all the characters are constantly speaking poetry? Well, maybe they were learned enough and they could speak poetry. But we don't have to necessarily make that case. Like if you consider Chaitanya Charitamrita. Now when Mahaprabhu came to Udupi, there's a description between him and uh, uh, his discussion with the Brahmanas there. Or we talk about his discussion with Prakashan Saraswati. Now that was definitely not in Bengali. Isn't it? That would have been Sanskrit. So when that has been translated into Bengali, then is it the exact same? Well, the some loss will be there in translation. But when there are great souls who are empowered, then the essential message is not lost. And especially with respect to Shastra, especially a core text like Bhagavata, Bhagavatam, we say that even if, for argument's sake, I'm not saying it is true, even if, for argument's sake, even if we say that Krishna spoke the Bhagavata in normal conversation, not in a poetic form, no Acharya has said that, so I'm only talking about that. I am granting the devil its due. I think the devil adds, even if we, for argument's sake, we say it's true. Even then, if we accept the tradition's version, that it is Vyasadev, even if he's, even if, he's also, even if say, we don't say the literary incarnation, but still, he's a very empowered soul. And, when he has put it in poetic form, it is clear from the sheer volume of his composition, that he's no ordinary person. So when he has put in certain words, those words are actually conveying Krishna's message. So we could almost say that if Krishna had spoken in poetic form, Krishna would have spoken it just like this. But it is also entirely possible, not only possible, I would say it's plausible, it's quite likely that it happened and that's how the Acharyas have seen it. Because see the books also have to be understood from that, the books are a part of the tradition and we want to understand the books as they have been understood in the tradition. And in the tradition, the commentators have always seen these to be literally the words of Krishna. 
Krishna spoke these words and this is what it means. So I think for some skeptical academic kind of scholars, we could grant the case. But we could say that still the essential message is there. Okay, the Bhagavad Gita was spoken in a different way. But, okay, you don't know what the Bhagavad Gita was, I don't know what the Bhagavad Gita was. But this is the Bhagavad Gita that has inspired millions for millennia, not even millions, billions for millennia. So, this is the Bhagavad Gita we should study. This is the Bhagavad Gita we should analyze. So, we could, we could grant some license for them, but for our practical purposes, so we could say that either Krishna himself, at least this conversation, he spoke it in a poetic format itself, in a song format, or it is that whatever Krishna spoke, exactly the same thing, Krishna as Vyasadeva put it in poetic format. Hmm? See, if like the same author composes, speaks something and the same author writes poetry conveying the same thing, then we could say the essential message is there. Maybe in the, so then, then there is no loss in translation like that. Hmm? Thank you. Yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Dhanush Pranam. Prabhuji, my question is how to avoid uh, a casual attitude towards, uh, towards bhaktas and bhakti? How to avoid casual attitudes? Well, by knowing that if you become casual, you will become a casualty. <laughs> That's one thing. But in general, there is not much uh, value in thinking of how not to do something. Because that will only create fear. Like if I'm driving and how not to cause an accident? Well, you know, that should not be the thinking, you know, how do I drive safely? That should be the focus. My focus is on driving safely, then automatically accident will not happen. Like when you're speaking, you don't worry, oh, I don't want to speak any foul words right now. No, you focus on what you're going to speak, then foul words will not come automatically. So similarly, if we are clear why I'm in the association of devotees, I'm to learn how to serve Krishna, how to love Krishna. Hmm? And if you just focus on that, then casual attitude will automatically decrease. And especially in the association of devotees, if you are hearing regularly, then that gravitas will also be there. That this is not just a social club. This is a spiritual movement. And that way also, the, so generally by keeping the purpose in mind and especially by hearing to nourish our intelligence so that that purpose stays in our mind, then we can avoid the casual attitude, which may lead to offenses. Thank you, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna, Dhanupa. Okay, yes, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Uh, Prabhuji, uh, like uh, the great devotees of Krishna, the gopis, they, they were in the, they were relishing Madhurya Ras with Krishna. But when we uh, hear the gopi Gita, where they have the knowledge that you are the Paramatma who is residing in everyone's heart, the great rishis and munis are glorifying and whoever hears it their miseries goes away so like he they were aware of their krishna's opulences but at the same time they were relishing madhuryaras so like generally when someone great comes in front of us we bow down and we offer obeisances and pray and but they never go to that level where they have other rasas than dasya ras. So how are how they were able to maintain that rasa? So that oh, is my okay. first question. And then I have another question. Okay. So if the gopis and madhuri rasa, then why are they talking about Krishna in Vrinda? Krishna is the Paramatma in all living beings. Well, I just did on Vrinda and then Mahashima did a whole series on Gopi Gita. So actually every Gopi Gita, every verse is essentially an appeal by one gopi please come back. Hmm? That, now some of the places there, they, they are very clearly saying that, Drushyata, please show yourself to us. Hmm? Uh, they, but some place, most of the verses, it is indirect. So what the gopis are doing is, they are using different reasonings to persuade Krishna to come back. So, let's they'll take only one verse because otherwise it took too much analysis. So see, in the third, uh, this is the word Nakhalu Gopika Nandano Bhavan Akhila Dehinam Antaraktma Druk Vikhana Sartito Vishwa Guptaye Sakha Udeyivan Satvatam Kule And the gopis are praying that in the previous verse they have said that Krishna, you have protected us from so many demons, you know 
ಕೆಡ್ವ್ಯಾಲ ರಾಕ್ಷಸ ಅದು ವರ್ಷ ಮಾರುತ್ತಾ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ನನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಐ ಯಾ ನೋ ಇಫ್ ಸೊ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಆಲ್ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಹ್ಯಾವಿಂಗ್ ಆನ್ ಇನ್ವಿಸಿಬಲ್ ಕಾನ್ವರ್ಸೇಷನ್ ವಿತ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಈಚ್ ಗೋಪಿ ಈಸ್ ಟೇಕಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಥ್ರೆಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಕಾನ್ವರ್ಸೇಷನ್ ಸೊ ದ ಪ್ರೀವಿಯಸ್ ಗೋಪಿ ಇಸ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಯು ಆರ್ ಪ್ರೊಟೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಸೋ ಮೆನಿ ಟೈಮ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಪಾಸ್ಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವೈ ಆರ್ ಯು ನಾಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಟೆಕ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಅಸ್ ನಾವು ದೆನ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಮೇ ಸೇ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ನೋ ದಟ್ ಐ ಆರ್ ಪ್ರೊಟೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಯು ಸೋ ಮೆನಿ ಟೈಮ್ಸ್ ಯು ನೋ ದಟ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಗಾಡ್ ಡೋಂಟ್ ವೈ ಯು ಟ್ರೀಟಿಂಗ್ ಮಿ ಲೈಕ್ ಅ ಆರ್ಡರಿ ಬಾಯ್ this no we certainly know na kallu gopika nandano bhava certainly we know that you are not just gopika nandana you are not just you are sir you are what akhila dehina antaratma drupad but you know the most expert debate is where you use the opponent's argument against them <laughs> is it it you they are using argument to make a particular point we use that very argument and make the opposite point so the gopis do this over here yes we know that you are not you are not one among us so you are akhila dehi nam antaratma druk you are the indwelling super soul of all living beings and specifically they don't use the word super soul they use the word super seer antaratma druk seer now that is and then he says for well that's significant why is it that okay if you are inside everyone then why have you come outside ವಿಖನಸಾರ್ಥಿತೋ ವಿಶ್ವಗುಪ್ತಯೇ ದಟ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಕಮ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಾಜಿ ಸೋ ದಟ್ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ವಾಸ್ ಇನ್ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರೆಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿ ಆಸ್ಟ್ ಯು ಟು ಕಮ್ ವಿಶ್ವಗುಪ್ತ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಪ್ರೊಟೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಸೊ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಸೇಯಿಂಗ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಕಮ್ ಟು ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಟು ಪ್ರೊಟೆಕ್ಟ್ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಫ್ರೀಡ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರೆಸ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಇನ್ಸೈಡ್ ಅವರ್ ಹಾರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಸೊ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸಿ ಹೌ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರೆಸ್ಡ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ದೇರ್ ಫೋರ್ ಯು ಶುಡ್ ಕಮ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ <laughs> so that's how the gopi is even when they are referring to krishna's greatness that is simply to emphasize krishna please come back they say you offer your lotus feet to kaliya so please now he was so sinful you he was undeserving he did nothing for you we are trying to serve you so please offer your lotus feet back to us, to us. please come back so wherever they are referring to krishna's greatness krishna's krishna's you could say vishnu vishnu greatness aishwarya there is also to intensify their call for him to come back okay thank you you can just speak i'll repeat it krishna krishna yeah so the another question is like uh, there are i i heard two versions of this story where krishna went from vrindavan to mathura and uh, and and the gopis were crying in separation and the other version is that there are two krishnas one is called vraja vraja raj who always live in vrindavan another is dwarka dish who uh, went and ruled there so one is the krishna left other says krishna never left so okay krishna it is both are true krishna left in the sense that krishna the form of krishna who left was vasudev krishna the vraja krishna remained but the vraja krishna was not visible it was not that after the after krishna left oh the gopis oh krishna is here only krishna is in the house no if that vraja krishna was present in an unmanifested form see you go so my talks about the two things see there is smruti okay this is smruti and there is spurti so smruti is more like conscious remem- recollection we try to cultivate remembrance of krishna conscious or conscientious we make endeavor but spurti is spontaneous recollection like this theme is called uh, atah shri krishna bhava atah shri krishna maadi na bhavet grahayam indriye sevon mukhi jiva do swayam eva spurtya da spurtya means man- manifest on its own so most of all the sadhakas we try to cultivate smriti but there are times when we also get spurti that means without even trying suddenly we feel like a river of devotion overflowing in our heart we feel like a fountain of devotion is spreading into our entire being we feel so rich devotion is enriched 
or that is like remembrance as arising on its own so it is described that after krishna departed that vraja krishna manifested as a spurti in the hearts of the vrajavasis they are constantly absorbed in the remembering krishna that's why when krishna was coming as spurti that is why when the vrajavasis are even trying to forget gopis are trying to forget krishna they couldn't forget krishna because that vraja krishna was manifesting as spurti within them so yes krishna did leave and the krishna who remained was not visible but he was experienceable as the constant flood of memories coming in their hearts okay. thank you any of the mataji have any last question okay okay so thank you very much shrimad bhagavad gita ki shila prabhupad ki gaur bhakta vrind ki nitai gaur premanande